Well, we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 8 today as we have been journeying all through uh, this year and uh, made it uh, five months and eight chapters, so seven chapters. We're moving into eight tonight. And uh, we'll go down through verse 23 tonight and look at some uh, interesting things as uh, some things begin to change and begin to happen. And uh, just so that you don't forget, or if you're just joining us, then I would remind you of a, a couple of things. By the way, we're glad to have the Wilmi- Will- Willinghams, James's parents. He always is so faithful to us. We ought to say hi to them right back here. They're from Odessa, Texas. And we think you have the most wonderful son that there is, and we're glad he does all this uh, good work for us. Uh, so that was all free, has nothing to do with the death of Stephen. But uh, Stephen uh, uh, comes along as one of the, uh, the prototype of the deacons, the, the apostolic emissaries, whatever you want to call them in Acts chapter 6, where he's assigned to a certain task. He doesn't... Uh, get as much of his task accomplished, I'm, I have no doubt, because uh, very quickly then, uh, having been uh, ordained, he carries out a ministry uh, of preaching, but it was an in- inadvertent ministry of preaching. He never felt the call to preach. Uh, what he felt was handcuffs. And uh, the handcuffs uh, led him to an opportunity to have to defend himself. And they said, hey, what do you have to say about these charges? Remember, the fa- they were false charges. And so he, uh, he didn't say, I'm guilty. Rather, he said, you're guilty. And uh, he showed them how they were guilty of rejecting the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who was promised all the way from the beginning and how they had done this many, many times before, and the, his, his uh, as is often called, his defense was so much an offense that they ended up picking up stones and dragging him out of the city and killing him for it. And I, I suppose that, uh, that only, uh, and uh, Mr. Battlestein could probably speak to this uh, better than any of us, um, until you've been around a crowd of Orthodox Jews, you don't know how serious the charges that uh, Stephen gives could actually be, because he comes with with uh, this th- this charge against them that you are children of your fathers who killed the prophets. And now you're even worse than that because you're not killing the prophets, you're killing the one of whom they prophesied. And that really was his sermon. And so they, they uh, pick up the stones and they begin to kill him and they know exactly what they're doing. And this time uh, we have the Holy Spirit so clearly upon him. He's got a face, looks like an angel, which is kind of the same description we have of Moses, the prophet. And so here we see this picture of, uh, I, I used last time the, the three deaths that we had, the death of John the Baptist in, uh, in which they allowed to happen, the death of Jesus, which, uh, the, the, let me back up, the death of John the Baptist. Baptist really was related to uh, the prophets, the father, the death of Jesus, the son, uh, uh, and of course, uh, that is one that they didn't, de- they didn't allow, they demanded, uh, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And here's one, they didn't demand, they actually performed the death. They killed Stephen, and it's related to the New Testament, and these three messages, messages and messengers that come, one being the son of Jesus Christ, of course, and here they commit the death of Stephen. And he has that prayer, do not hold this sin against them. Literally, you may remember, do not stand against them in this sin. And uh, the thing that that set it over, the straw that broke the camel's back was in verse 56 when he said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they said, no way are you going to say that about us. It doesn't seem offensive to us, but here he is. When he says he is standing at the right hand, it is to say he, is, he, is, he has arisen to pronounce judgment. And now it is going to come. And so they, uh, they of course, were not going to accept this at all. And based upon that, he, uh, he was dragged to his death. The last words that he's speaking is, do not stand against them. The question is, is the Lord going to sit down or is he now going to pour out judgment? The answer is not going to come tonight. But we are going to proceed from there and we're going to see what happens. So uh, we, we ended up, we, we had uh, just a little bit earlier, you remember, earlier last week in uh, 
verse, one of those verses there about uh, the young man that was laying at laying, uh, holding the garments as they were uh, stoning Stephen. And his name was Saul, and he was introduced uh, to us there. And then it says in chapter 8, verse 1, that Saul, this young man holding the coats, was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Now, let's just uh, stop and talk about Saul here for just a moment. Uh, Saul was in Tarsus, right? Uh, Tarsus was his home. He no doubt had come to Jerusalem at some point. There's no, uh, no telling how long he had been in Jerusalem. But there is indication as you begin to study his life that he was actually not in Jerusalem during the bulk of Jesus' ministry, that he probably was in Tarsus. And uh, so he was not one of those who had been eyewitness to all the things that the Lord had brought about and, and, uh, and had seen, and Saul gives this own, his own testimony of that, and yet uh, here he is uh, sometime later at the death of, of uh, Stephen, and uh, he's just standing there as a young man uh, seeing all this. Now, I think one of the reasons that it's important, and we probably uh, should have, though I don't have the references here, we should have gone back and built the case a little bit more that Saul was not actually a part of uh, what was going on in Jerusalem, for example, in that crowd that said, give us Barabbas and crucify Jesus, that Saul was absent from that. Because when you begin to look in Matthew chapter 12, as we did just briefly last week, at the unpardonable sin, I uh, propose to you that the unpardonable sin is uh, not something that we bring into this age, but the unpardonable sin is actually something that one generation of one age could have committed and actually did commit. And that was the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as, as the Messiah, and it's, the, it's, it's that sin which only that generation which is alive and well and seeing it, the Messiah, can do. You see, we can't, we, we can't uh, reject Jesus as Messiah in a sense. We can reject him as Savior, can't we? Uh, we can reject him as Lord. We can reject the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but only the nation of Israel can accept, receive, or reject Jesus as her Messiah. And uh, so we weren't there to do that, and, but there was a nation there that did that very thing. And when you read uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 12 closely, I think that you see that this is what uh, happens. And so there was this curse put upon that generation, and yet here's a guy who would have agreed had he been there, but he wasn't there. And so Saul takes this one who is of that generation, but not specifically part of that curse, and says, I guess what? I'm going to use him. So here comes this Saul of Tarsus who is standing here in hearty agreement with putting him to death. The, the term there for hearty agreement, uh, the uh, King James. Does anyone have a King James? What word does it use? Consenting. It was consenting. By the way, just a, 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 a mid-sermon advertisement. How's that? Tomorrow night on our online Bible study at 8 p.m., I'm going to talk about why you should have a King James Version of the Bible and uh, how much you can get out of studying the Bible, the English Bible in King James that you can't get out of studying any other translations. So you can tune in tomorrow night at 8 o'clock if you'd like to do so. Uh, but it says he was consenting with them. Now, the term, it does mean consenting or to come along in a hearty agreement. But as you uh, look it up through the times it's used in the scripture, which is only four or five times, it, it really gives uh, str more strongly even the idea that he voted with them. That here comes Saul, and it's not just that in his heart he was agree in agreement, but that he was, he was together with them so completely that he was one of the decision makers that brought him to his death. In fact, uh, the uh, scripture that uh, is used in Acts chapter 26, verse 10, uh, actually uh, says, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, in prison having received from, uh, authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. Now, he's not talking about Stephen, uh, in Acts 26.10, but he's talking about those saints that uh, very quickly he will be uh, putting to death. And he says, I cast my vote against them. Here he uses this, it's a different term that he uses in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, 
but it says he consents or he's in hearty agreement. And it's a word that very often in the New Testament, it appears to have an idea of casting a vote or, or, or something stronger than just saying, mm-hmm, yep, they did the right thing. But rather he is a part of the decision maker. Now, if that's true, that he, uh, he was casting his vote uh, to uh, bring about the death penalty here, then what, uh, what we have is that Saul had to have been a member of the Sanhedrin. And if he was a member of the Sanhedrin, that is the 70, the, the, the Supreme Court of Israel the, 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 in, in religious matters, if he really was a part of the Sanhedrin, then we know he's a young man because the passage has already said this. So he is an extremely impressive young man. So much so that uh, he says, it gives his own testimony in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, when he says, uh, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. It sounds like someone who, if he's not in the Sanhedrin, we'd at least want to put him there, right? Uh, at least he's headed to the Sanhedrin. Now, I have a feeling that maybe even he was a young, impressive member of the Sanhedrin or headed to the, to the Sanhedrin, and everybody knew it. He was up and coming, and so it's not just who's this young man here, but somebody they all knew. And uh, by the way, we uh, put forth the idea last week, and as I uh, looked over it just a little bit this week, I think there's some, uh, quite a bit of merit to it that Saul... Uh, later, Paul, of course, is probably the one from whom Luke gets his uh, firsthand information here. Saul and Luke, uh, uh, Paul and Luke being very much uh, very close friends and partners in the work that they are doing. So if Saul is a member of the Sanhedrin, he's actually uh, together in the vote. And it's hard telling here whether or not, I, I think they probably did, but uh, it was it was, it was kind of a quick vote, wasn't it? But they were already there together anyway, and the high priest was uh, officiating this thing, and it came to it, and they were, uh, uh, they were done with it, and uh, they just shouted out, all in favor of his death say aye. And there was a unanimous consent, and they went at it. And this uh, began to take, take place. So if Saul is a Sanhedrin, it uh, does tell us that he was married with children because that was one of the requirements of being a Sanhedrin. Of course, we know later he was single, which uh, tells us uh, it, it would have to be, the only option really is that his wife would have died somewhere. Now, all that's uh, supposition because we don't really know if he was a member of the Sanhedrin. We don't really know if he was uh, married. We don't know some of these things. So here he is in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And continuing on in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On that day, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Uh, there arose a, gr a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now, uh, the, uh, the Greek is, I think, a little more strong to tell us even that they're very likely on that very day was more than just Stephen who died. There likely were some others that died along with him, which uh, just, uh, just a thought just came to me. Uh, in one sense, isn't it kind of a bummer if you die a martyr on the same day, but you don't even get mentioned? <laughs> uh, and yet that could be the way it is for you and I. And uh, if, if that's true, nonetheless, even if nobody died that day, certainly a persecution began that day that caused a lot of people to die and caused a lot of people to uh, lose their homes and their businesses and all they had to have built for and all their dreams and to move away to some faraway place in order to have any kind of safety. And it all began here, the, what we would later call the Christian dispersion began right here. And uh, took place. And honestly, we don't know the names of any of those people. And that's more often the way persecution is, isn't it? That it's uh, nameless, faceless, nobody knows. And uh, someday you and I may be, have to be prepared to, uh, to, to die in prison with nobody even knowing about it. Uh, or to die a martyr and no one even knowing about it. Because few there are, like Stephen, who get their story recorded down uh, in the ages. Even if you take uh, that classic book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's great nighttime reading if you enjoy nightmares. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it just it gives, gives an account of so many martyrs down through history. And uh, in, a, in a sense, it's inspirational on some of the stories that they had. But how many millions upon millions never get their story told? I mean, you, you wonder how many even today are in North Korean prisons because of their faith. I understand there's thousands upon thousands, even tens of thousands of Christians in North Korea who are imprisoned today precisely because they're Christians. And uh, as, as we think about this, you know, here's one who had his name, but we don't know the rest. So there came uh, about on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. Now, once again, I have said that I don't think the church age has yet begun. The church age doesn't begin until Romans 11 verse 15 tells us until, uh, Israel is in its stage of rejection because their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world. And we're not there yet. So you say, well, see, pastor, you're wrong. It says right there, the church. So there's the church. How can you have the church when it's not in the church age? Well, you might remember you have it in Matthew chapter 18 also, uh, when, uh, uh, the Lord says, uh, you know, if a brother sins and goes through the process there and take it to the church. But the word there really is, of course, ecclesia. And uh, ecclesia is often translated church and uh, even carried over into the Spanish language. Iglesia is church. But literally all it meant was the assembly. And it's a, it's a gathering, it's a group of people that have the same kind of beliefs or standards, uh, and it could have been used, to, you know, in that day if they'd had Rotary and Lions Club and, uh, and YMCA and all these kind of things, uh, you're just together in some kind of an assembly where you're together for the same purposes, and that's what was used there. By the way, in English, uh, the word church obviously doesn't come from Iglesia, uh, but uh, the word church comes from... What, do y'all never study languages? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, I'm really giving that long pause because I'm trying to think of it. Uh, I, I, I believe I'm going to pronounce this right. Kuriakos. Kuriakos. Now, you may know that in Greek, kurios means what? I think someone said Lord. Uh, kurios means Lord. Kuriakos means of the Lord. And uh, kuriakos came to mean church. So church literally means of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and kuriakon is uh, uh, lordly. <laughs> uh, so that idea came the, uh, over and, and uh, the English uh, world translated that in, as eventually church. But here it says the assembly. So the assembly here are believers the assembly here believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The assembly here even believes that Jesus has died, buried, rose again, and that they have to place their faith in him. But the actual age of the church, I don't think has yet begun. We'll see some evidence of that later. So a great persecution began against this assembly in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, does, uh, the, the, that uh, verse has three places in it, doesn't it? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, right? Does any of that sound familiar? And uh, maybe from what verse? That would be the, uh, the, the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Uh, and if you're taking it from Acts, you would get it from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, right? You'll be my witnesses and all the world beginning in Jerusalem and also Judea and unto Samaria and to the remotest part of the earth. Now, when you think of Acts 1.8, you ought to also think of Acts 8.1. Because here we come, we've got the same three places that are given, given here in uh, Ju Ju Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And they're all scattered out against, the, uh, against these places. Now, I could almost... Uh, uh, know what you're going to read if you read uh, maybe a note in your study Bible or if you pick up a commentary off the shelf on what it says about Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Probably says something about the early church was not being obedient in the spread of the gospel like they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be going into all the earth and here we are and they've never even left Jerusalem. 
So in order to get the church out of Jerusalem, what does God bring upon the church? Persecution. At least that's the storyline. So God's bringing persecution upon the church in order to get them out of Jerusalem, in order that they would go do the thing that they would need to do. And of course, then the pastor would come up with the, with the application part of the sermon that if you don't get out there and witness like you're supposed to, God may create an opportunity for you. That would be a really good sermon, wouldn't it? Now, it's not really all that true to the text, but it would seem to, to be a really good sermon. Now, here... Uh, uh, first of all, I, 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 you know, I mean, you can put uh, the, the, the providence of God is a hard thing to see. The hand of God, the invisible God is a hard thing to see. But I don't see any indication here that God's in this. Rather, I see that the devil's in this. They are rejecting, the nation is rejecting her own Messiah. God's coming down in judgment upon the nation. And uh, whenever a, a, a godless nation is judged, they tend to go after the godly, don't they? And so I, I would paint this to say, hey, this is much more of a satanic picture that's taking place here than it is some work of God. But they're being scattered, and of course, they, uh, they're dispersed. They're going out thoroughly. Thoroughly dispersed is the word. And uh, they're going out through the regions of Judea and of Samaria. Uh, of course, you know, that would be staying in what today would be the Holy Land still. But uh, they're going out uh, to these places uh, to, uh, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Though we always say, of course, I mean, those commentaries always say, this is what God's doing to get them out and about. Notice that we have to skip one little part, except the apostles. Everybody's being scattered except the apostles. Well, that's because they were more stubbornly disobedient than all the rest of them. And even persecution wouldn't get them out sharing the gospel. Does that sound like a good sermon? <laughs> Not really. I mean, you have to be really down upon the apostles if you carry that sermon all the way through. But what if your message is, uh, is something different? What if your message is that God came to the apostles and uh, he, he taught them about the kingdom of God? And he said, the kingdom of God is going to come when the Jewish nation accepts Jesus as her Messiah. And you need to go and tell them that her Messiah has come. Her Messiah has taken care of everything that needs to be done from coming to being, uh, taking on their sins, dying, buried, right, risen again. And uh, he stands now fulfilling all the prophecies and ready to fulfill, fulfilling all the prophecies about his arrival, are ready to fulfill the prophecies of what he would do when he gets here. And the nation needs to accept him. Now, not only does he say that to the apostles, but he says, guess what? When this kingdom is established, and it's going to be established in Jerusalem, that's where the king is going to be and the throne is going to be. And when it's going to be established, you who are apostles are going to be a part of this kingdom. So much so that 12 of you, you 12 who are apostles are going to have a what? You're going to have a throne. You're going to have a throne with me. You're going to be a part of ruling in this kingdom. And you're going to do it right here from Jerusalem with me. This will be the center of the kingdom. I'll lead. The 12 of you will, uh, will, uh, will, will reign on thrones there along with me. Now I want you to tell this message. It's a message which Jerusalem has got to receive. And once they receive it, guess what else? Judea's got to receive it. And Samaria's got to receive it. And under the remotest parts of the earth, this message is going to go and it's going to spread. So if that's the message they were believing and understanding, isn't it uh, uh, something that we would expect of the apostles who by this time are, are completely knowledgeable and faithful? We would expect them to say, if persecution comes, regardless of how strong it comes, uh, we're not leaving Jerusalem until Jerusalem receives her Messiah. And uh, this, I think, is exactly what happens. And before the apostles ever leave the, the Jerusalem as their station of ministry, and uh, some of it's doubtful even whether they ever did, regardless of the traditions that we have in the church, before they ever do, though, God is going to release them from that commission. And we'll see this as, uh, as we go along. So here, I think we see 
the people are being scattered, that assembly is being scattered, but the apostles are saying, like Peter earlier said, now he's being true to it, even if all others flee you, I will not. I will die here. I'll be faithful. I am going to, uh, to present the demands or the, the uh, rights of the kingdom of being unto Christ in Jerusalem. So, continuing on in verse 2, and uh, when it takes 30 minutes to do one verse, that's why we only make it through eight chapters in five months. It says some devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lamentation over him. But Paul began ravaging the church. I, I want to camp out a little on verse two. King J, excuse me, uh, New American Standard puts some devout men, inserts the word some. King James, I think, says and devout men, correct? So, and devout men, some devout men. Uh, I honestly don't know why New American Standard puts some because there really is a Greek word that's under it. That's a very common Greek word. It's a Greek, it's the two letters D-E, de. And it's a word that can either be a, uh, a, a, a well, it's a conjunction. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? You remember that? Uh, and a conjunction joins things together. And uh, there are two ways that this little word day, conjunction, can join things together. One is just a continuative. This means, and next, here's what happens. The other is an adversative, which means we're right here, and now I want to shift, and I want to show you the other side of the coin. I want to show you the opposite right here. Now, the problem is, it's both D-E. There's no way to know, is this a, an adversative which we would normally translate but, or a conjunctive, which we would normally translate and. So but and and are the same word. You have to go by context. Now, the uh, good uh, uh, translators of the King James decided to go with and. The uh, translators of the, of the NASB, I think, decided we don't know what to do with it, so they put in the word some which, and, and just left out but or and all together and just said some. Uh, and no doubt it was some, but the word, there is a word for some and it's not there. Uh, and, and so you really have to decide, okay, is this just, okay, the next thing is devout men. I honestly think that the, what, the, what this is, is, a, is an indication that those who were being scattered, those who were leaving, really weren't doing what they should have been doing. They should have stayed there in Jerusalem and endured the persecution and continued to preach the message, but they were being scattered. And then I would put, but instead of and. So, but devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. Seems like quite a contrast from there's persecution, let's get out while the getting's good. <laughs> And so I think, and I could be wrong here, and if so, I'll later apologize to those who left. Uh, but it looks to me like some were leaving disobediently, but there were devout men. Why does it call them devout men? In a sense, we don't even care. Uh, we don't even care if he got buried, honestly, do we? Of just whatever, he's dead. He had this angelic experience at the end. We're done with his story. But devout men heard Stephen. And they made loud lamentations over him. That's a contrast to the persecution that you see and some people are leaving. So I think we've got the, the apostles, the devout men. They are not like, what's the old saying? When the, uh, when, when the, when the tough gets, time gets tough, the tough get going. Is that it? Thank you. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Uh, this is sort of the opposite here. When the going gets tough, the tough stay right there, grind their heels in and say, kill us if you want. We're going to make loud lamentations and bury our martyr right here. And uh, it's a little bit like, uh, since we're all Texans here, right? Or wannabe. Uh, it's a little bit like that. Uh, is it the Gonzalez cannon? Come and take it. <laughs> and they are, I mean, you know, they're, they're declaring war against Israel, really as they come with these loud lamentations. Uh, it's, uh, the, I've forgotten the Greek word for lamentations there, but uh, 
It is uh, the word, I believe King James says mourning, but it's, it's, it's the word that, uh, give, it's the idea of uh, beating the chest. And it literally, if you translated it literally, it, it means to cut. In fact, we get our English word hatchet from it. And uh, so the idea of the Jewish people is they tear their clothes uh, and uh, here's the lamentations that are going and it's, uh, it, it, they're, they're doing it very loudly in the midst of it. And then we have the same word in verse three, de, it's either a and or a but. And the translators of NASB here decide to say, oh, this is, this is uh, in contrast to those devout men but Saul began ravaging the assembly, entering house after house and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Later on, he uh, gave his own testimony that his desire, of course, was to, uh, to stamp out the church, to uh, do away with the church. And going on in verse 4, it says, therefore... Those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Now, if I uh, was too harsh on those who were scattered a moment ago, my apologies, because at least they are doing something good as they get out there, and they're preaching the word. The question then, of course, any good student of the word would uh, ask is, which word? <laughs> which word are they preaching as they go out? And I would say, well, they're preaching the only word they had. And that is the word about Christ's right of, uh, of kingship, that he was the Messiah, that he was the one fulfilling all the promises that uh, the nation needed to receive him as their Messiah. And they're going about proclaiming this. They, they, they can't really be going about proclaiming, hey, guess what? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. As a matter of fact, as you uh, begin to look here, I believe I've got a reference uh, somewhere along the way, but... Uh, uh, as uh, you begin to look here, what you see, I don't know where that reference is, but it's on your notes somewhere, uh, that uh, the, the scripture in the book of Acts, uh, I believe it's chapter 11, very clearly says that when they went out, they preached the word to no one except Jews alone. So they're in Samaria, they're in Judea, but they are only preaching to Jews. It's very clear uh, somewhere in Acts chapter 11. Now, as uh, they're going out, uh, they, they preached uh, the word. Now, where is it that they're preaching the word? Judea and where? Samaria. And uh, Philip goes down to a city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, of course, again, if we're not very careful with our wording and with our theology and with our history, and we, we uh, start just making up what we think we wanted to say, then we've got Philip, he's going out and he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're having these Baptist churches start up all over Samaria. Uh, and, of course, we say that uh, the Samaritans, they weren't Jews, uh, and, uh, and yet the problem is that so many, so many uh, corners to that problem. One is that Paul tells us the mystery of, uh, of a Gentile coming to Christ outside of Jerusalem was, uh, and I don't mean the territory of Jerusalem, outside of coming to God through Christ in Jerusalem would be uh, not given till later. So we have to disagree with Paul if we do that. We have to disagree with Acts 11 where it says they were preaching only to Jews while they were in Samaria. And uh, we have to uh, uh, just disagree with what later we're going to see is what they're actually saying when they get down here and they're actually preaching. It's not the kind of thing that you and I would say and preach, but it is the kind of thing if we were preaching a gospel of the kingdom that we would say and preach. So they, uh, it's uh, beginning in verse five again, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Literally, it says, uh, began uh, proclaiming the Messiah to them. So we, again, when we talk about preaching Christ, we have in our mind what that is. But if we translated that, preaching the Messiah to them, okay, well then all this, all of a sudden it fits completely. So he's there in Samaria. By the way, the Samaritans were Jews. They just weren't really good Jews. Uh, but 
Jesus, who went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, of course, in John chapter 4, he went into Samaria, didn't he? Talked to the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. There was a revival there that uh, uh, is in many ways indicative or, or a, a, a scene also here in uh, this revival that we're about to see under Philip, who is also one of those like Stephen, uh, one of those uh, um, early deacons or apostolic emissaries. And uh, they, they were really part of the 10 tribes that we often call the lost tribes of Israel. They're not really lost. They, uh, they, they, they were there. Some of them never left. Some of them came back. There was some intermarriage there. Uh, but some things in the Old Testament we could go and really lay, if we, had, uh, if we were going to do tonight as a six-hour Bible study, maybe we would, lay out how the Samaritans were Jews. And uh, uh, there's some very interesting things in the Old Testament that are given there. So Philip is there going to a city of Samaria, proclaiming the Messiah to them. Verse 6, the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. So as they heard and saw, uh, excuse me, as they heard, I'm going to start that over and read that right. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. Crowd's pretty interested here. Remember, as I've already mentioned, Jesus was there. And what kind of response did Jesus get in Samaria? It was actually very positive. As this woman went and uh, she told everybody else what Christ had said, and they came back, they begged him to stay two more days. You remember as we looked in John chapter 4, and uh, John chapter 4, I believe, uh, before it has this healing of the nobleman's son, it closes out then uh, that portion of the story by telling that, uh, that many people, maybe it even says multitudes, believed on Jesus there. And they were eager people that wanted to worship the Lord, as the woman at the well says, you know, where are we supposed to worship? We want, I want to do the right thing. Is it supposed to be here or is it supposed to be there? How are we supposed to do it? So it's a receptive crowd, much more receptive than Jerusalem. And it goes on in verse 7, for in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and the lame were healed so that there was much rejoicing in that city. Now, there was a man named Simon. By the way, that word now is the little word de, which typically is translated one of two ways. You remember? <laughs> and or but. Uh, now, when you translate it as now, it's almost an equivalent of and. Uh, so and, let's uh, keep on going. But maybe he's really saying, okay, let me give you a contrast. All these people receiving in Acts chapter 8 just seems to be going back and forth from the good to the bad, the good to the bad, the good to the bad. And uh, so, verse 9, but there's a man named Simon. There seems to be a lot of Simons in the Bible, doesn't there? And uh, I uh, had a friend once uh, from Israel who told me that in Jesus' day, about 80% of the men held five names. Uh, Simon being one of them. And they were the names of the, uh, the, the Macca Maccabean uh, uprisers, uh, the Maccabean kings, and uh, Simon and Judas and, and uh, uh, some of these uh, names like this. So there's a man named Simon who uh, formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. It's, it's almost uh, that they were saying, maybe Simon's the Messiah. Here he is doing magic. And again, as we've looked at a number of times here recently, Deuteronomy chapter 30 talks about a prophet who actually does uh, divination, magic work, and it's real. It's not a sleight of hand, but it's real. Uh, let's just suppose this is what it is. And so this man is called the great power of God. He's either a prophet or he's sent from God. Maybe he's the Messiah. But uh, here are the Samaritans, and they're quite impressed with this. From the smallest to the greatest, they were giving attention to him. I might just add that we ought to be kind of careful at being impressed with the mystical. And uh, here comes a group that, you know, Simon does whatever Simon does, and wow, we're impressed with that. And we probably ought to be so careful to leave those kind of things with, well, that's uh, 
that's cool, all right. Boy, that, uh, that was different. That, that'd make the evening news. But I'm not basing my belief system on that. I'm not uh, going to get my theology from that. I'm not going to uh, even allow my heart to be moved uh, in that. I'm just going to say, okay, that was impressive. I'll give that to you. But my theology comes from the Word of God. Because in the end, we'll be raptured by this time, but the end, the scripture says the Antichrist is going to do such uh, phenomenal works that if it were possible, he would even lead astray the elect. And he's going to do it by his magic, if you will. Uh, So here comes Simon. We often call him Simon Magus, by the way, in history books because of the magic work he does. Uh, And so uh, continuing on in verse 11, they, all these people, small and great, were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, what's, P, what's Peter preaching? Philip, excuse me, the kingdom of God. He is, as he said earlier, introducing the Messiah to them or proclaiming the Messiah to them, saying, hey, guess what? The Messiah, his name's Jesus. We're here to proclaim him to you. He's he's going to establish his kingdom. Here's the criteria for it. And uh, so he is uh, uh, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And they were baptized, men and women alike, just like we saw from John the Baptist uh, up and through Peter. Verse 13, even Simon himself believed. And after he was baptized, he continued on with Philip. Now, let me ask uh, you a question. Was Simon a believer? Did Simon believe? You don't know what you want to do with that, do you? (laughs) Do you believe the Bible? (laughs) 13 says he believed. Even Simon himself believed. In fact, he was baptized. In fact, he continued on with Philip. As he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. It sounds to me like he's a real believer. Now, the reason you want to say he's not a real believer is because you know the rest of the story. But I don't want you to go there yet. And I also don't want you to doubt the word. Uh, And the word says he believed. Now, here's the struggle you're having in your heart. And uh, this is where the commentary is going to once again go a little bit astray. And it's probably going to say he believed, but it was... uh, it was just a, uh, a head belief and not a heart belief. Or they might say, well, no, maybe it was a heart belief and not a head belief. Or they'll say, I don't really know what kind of belief it was, but it wasn't obviously the right kind of belief because look at the kind of guy he turned out to be. And then, of course, the preacher's going to turn and say to you, now you better make sure you got the right kind of belief. And you might be saying, oh, I can't really put my finger on what the right kind of belief is. I hope I got the right kind of belief. I believed. I was baptized. I was amazed. Maybe you were amazed at the miracles of the Word of God. Maybe you were amazed at the Word of God. Whatever it was, you came and you believed. And then, you know, look what happened to Simon. And I don't know. And so the preacher is either going to cause you doubt and say, you better believe again, just in case you didn't believe right the first time. Let's uh, check this out. Or or he's going to turn it into a workspace kind of thing and say, now, look, you can lose your salvation and you can, uh, like Simon, you know, some might say Simon lost his salvation. So depending on where you come from, you're either going to say Simon was never saved in the beginning. He just had a false belief or uh, Simon lost his salvation. The, the, the sad part about it, that is we don't have to have just those two choices. How about this choice? He honestly, truly believed. It's exactly what it says here. But this was not the dispensation in which believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This was a dispensation in which you better repent, you better be baptized, you better live according to the law as the king comes, and this is how you're going to come into ultimately your salvation. So he's, uh, he's carrying out a, 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 a law-based belief here, I think. So we don't, have to, we don't have to deal with it. We can say verse 13 is true because there's no indication that he kind of believed, sort of believed, maybe didn't uh, really believe. And, and we can just take the word of God just exactly as it is. He believed. It was just before the age in which when you believed, you were uh, saved and secure. So going on in verse 14. Now... 
when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. What in the world do we need to send Peter and John for? Look, how, look what Peter and John do. Verse 15, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord. And they began laying their hands upon them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Does this sound like Baptist doctrine? If so, we would call people to believe, and then we'd call people to be baptized. And then at some point, we'd call people uh, up to the front to be ordained, to, to, to have their hands, ha have hands laid upon them by someone who had been ordained by someone who had apostolic succession. And uh, that is the teaching of a lot of different kind of uh, uh, denominations out there or, or, uh, or sects out there that somewhere along the way, the apostolic ordination was passed down one to another, to another, to another, to another. And you received that person who was ordained at the ordination, received apostolic authority so that they then could dispense the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you think uh, it would go if I said, I think that according to the scripture, I am the only one who can dispense the Holy Spirit unto you? All in favor, say aye. Any questions? <laughs> of course you'd be against that. And yet that's what's happening here is, hey, we got some new believers. Peter, John, we need you up here. Come on. I think uh, specifically Peter's mentioned here. Of course, Peter's the one, you remember, whom God says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. What you loose will be loose. What you bind will be bind. And this is an age in which I think Peter has that authority. And uh, he brings along with him John. If you don't want to go that far with those keys to the kingdom, maybe you could at least go to uh, Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus says to, literally, to his disciples, not to everybody who ever lived uh, and every believer who ever lived, but he said to his apostles, not his disciples, he said to his apostles, wherever two of you are gathered in my name, two or three of you, you have authority to do whatever you want to do. And so here they send two. There's already a third one there. Uh, and that is, uh, is based even in Matthew chapter 18 on the Old Testament that it takes two or three witnesses to come together. So here are in the absence of the Lord, two, three who can come together and have the authority to act in Christ's behalf. Now, that's not good Christian doctrine. I don't have the authority to act in Christ's behalf. I'm not, nor is... is uh, Start to say Benedict, but I forgot who the Pope is today. Francis. Nor is Francis the vicar of Christ. You know what vicar means, don't you? The substitute, the stand-in, in his place, in his stead. Uh, I, I, I'm not that. But Peter and John certainly are behaving on the, like, like this. So, verse 17, they began laying hands upon them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're not a dispensationalist, then you just got to come up with some other reason to say that's not the reason we do it today. I think it's a lot easier just to say that age is different than this age. They were in a transitionary period, uh, called, we'd call it Pentecost, and that uh, Pentecostal age, and that's all going to end when the church later comes. Now, verse 18, that's the same word, I think we could contrast, but when Simon saw that the spirit was bestowed through the laying on of, of the apostles' hands, did you catch how strong that was? How was the spirit bestowed? Through the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's the only way the spirit was bestowed. He offered them money. And of course, from that very uh, uh, incident there, we have in our English uh, language now, the, uh, the, the term that when you, when you give money uh, to a religious uh, organization in order to gain some spiritual power, you call it what? Simony. We don't use it all the time, but it's called simony after this guy's name right here. Uh, look it up in the dictionary if you don't believe me. <laughs> so he offered them money, saying in verse 19, give this authority to me as well. Is that even possible? Uh, no. 
This is apostolic authority. Even Philip couldn't do it. He had been ordained. Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. It's so strong through there. There's only one way to get the Holy Spirit, and it's not the way you and I got the Holy Spirit. So something's changed between them and and, and us. Verse 20, but Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Lots of preaching we could do there, but we'll go on. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. He was a believer, but his heart was not right before God, right? So uh, am I going to see him in heaven? Well, he's a believer. No, I'm not going to see him in heaven because he was not in this age of believe on the Lord, you'll be saved. Verse 22, therefore, repent. That's the age he was in. Repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. Why if possible? Because when you read the law, there are only certain sins and manner of sins which could be forgiven. And you better pray, Simon, that this is one of those that somehow you're going to be able to find some forgiveness from because it doesn't matter how much you believe. You had to have that belief, but you got to have more uh, than that. Verse 23, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. Problem is, there wasn't a lot the law could do for someone in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. But, verse 24, Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. I don't know if he's sincere or if he's saying, do it yourself. I have no way of knowing. Verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to the many villages of the Samaritans. But literally, it doesn't say preaching the gospel, does it? It says they were proclaiming good news to the villages of the Samaritans. The good news is, guess what? The Messiah has come. The nation now needs to receive him. Now, looks like, we're going to stop right there. Looks like we have an indication that God's judgment hasn't yet completely fallen. And that maybe... Stephen's prayer is being answered, Lord, don't stand against them on this sin. We're going to see how long it lasts as uh, we come along here, but we're, we're uh, very much beginning to move into a transition time where everything is going to change unbelievably. And with that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for men like Philip. We're grateful for those uh, even scattered, whatever their motive was, that uh, they went out and they did proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. We're grateful for the apostles and the steadfastness at which they had and these devout men who buried uh, Stephen even with, with uh, loud lamentations and the willingness of risk that they were able to take upon themselves. We pray that uh, whether we stay or whether we go, that we are faithful at sharing the good news that is for our age, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.